The number one question that probably comes into our organization or uh, is asked at, at our seminars, uh, of course, is when's the best time to cruise? And quite honestly, when it comes to the, the cruise season in Alaska, starting generally around May 10th, May 15th, and running through about September 20th, uh, the easy answer is there isn't a bad time. When you compare the Alaska destination to other places across the globe that the cruise lines travel, uh, the major advantage that Alaska has is this scenery right here. It's the glaciers, it's the mountains, it's the marine wildlife. It, it truly is unmatched in that standpoint. Um, on a general seven day round trip itinerary from Vancouver or Seattle, of course, you'll have all the uh, amenities that go along with cruising, the, the luxury uh, staterooms and the service and the uh, amenities like the lounges and the casinos. Uh, but what, what makes Alaska special is what's outside the ship. And, uh, and that's that scenery. Uh, there's very few places, if any, in the world where you can uh, cruise and have that kind of scenery for seven days. And quite possibly, even on the large ships that sail the waters today, you have land on both sides, the port and the starboard side of the vessel for four, three, four, five of the seven days. Uh, so really, the, the answer to that, and, and I'm not trying to sound generic, uh, but really there isn't a bad time to cruise Alaska. Uh, again, uh, the comfort of your stateroom, especially these verandas, uh, if you are a little bit uncomfortable with cooler weather, which you know earlier in the year and again later in the year, uh, as you get into August, September can be a little bit cooler. You do have that ability to step outside on your veranda, but then of course come in the climate controlled atmosphere of your well-appointed staterooms. And like I said, um, a number of activities uh, on the ship, whether it be in the casino or the show lounges, or of course the spa and salon treatment. Uh, these vessels today that sail into Alaska's waters, uh, about 45 different vessels cruise into Alaska each summer. Um, they are quite honestly like floating uh, Las Vegas resorts. Uh, they're, they're well appointed and, and uh, again, the, uh, the amenities and attention to detail is pretty spectacular. Uh, when it comes to cruising, you know, sometimes people ask us, or oftentimes people ask us, are there things that I need to avoid while I'm on the cruise ship? Um, I guess the easy answer to that would be yes. And that would uh, be indicated here in my particular slide. Um, I've never been one who thinks that, when I think of cruising to Alaska, the last thing, or at least the second to last thing that I would think about would be, focusing my time and attention on the, the jewelry shopping. But of course, if you've cruised across the globe and maybe you've cruised to Alaska and experienced this yourself, you know, the idea of getting off the ship and uh, spending your time on the trail of diamonds or the trail of jewels from Tanzanite International to Diamonds International, that to me is not what Alaska is truly about. It's obviously the glaciers, it's the wildlife, the scenery, and we want you to to spend your time in the ports of call with the real Alaskans, not shop owners who come in and uh, spend May, June, July, August, September, and then leave and return to their shops in the Caribbean or the Mediterranean. Another question that we often get and also tied into the cruise side of things is, uh, you know, what are the best shore excursions? Uh, on average, uh, you probably see around 40 to 50 offerings in each port of call. Again, Skagway, Juno, Ketchikan being the primary ports, maybe Icy Strait Point being another one. Uh, and during your eight to 10 to 12 hours in each of these ports, the, the cruise line of course encourages you to sign up and participate in these excursions. And I would say this is certainly a better way to spend your time than in the diamond stores. Uh, that said, you know, of the uh, 40 or 50 offerings inside each port, um, there are a select few that really stand out, uh, in my opinion, above the others. Uh, very historical, uh, unique journeys like the ones pictured here. This is the White Pass in Yukon, the uh, narrow gauge train that snakes its way from Skagway, Alaska, up the White Pass uh, to, uh, to Fraser. Of course, this tracks the route that the prospectors and miners took in uh, 1898 when they came to Alaska and then eventually on to the Yukon Territory where the uh, yeah. took place. Another excursion that I think uh, we, we have to highlight, um, of course, is also on the top tier in terms of expense when it comes to these optional excursions is that of the, the dog mushing, dog sledding. Uh, you know, where else in the world can you go uh, you get off your ship, 
you travel by van or bus over to a, a helicopter pad or an airport and you take off in the helicopter and 25 minutes later you land on a glacier where an actual Iditarod dog team will spend its summer training and then of course hosting visitors from across the globe as they mush for 20, 30, 40 minutes. Uh, this is iconic Alaska to me. Uh, this is one of those things that if you're going to make a an investment in, in a single big ticket excursion while you're there, you know, where else can you do that? Uh, to, of course, again, right across a glacier is one thing, but to, to be in tow with uh, a team of Iditarod dogs, uh, it's pretty special. So certainly one that I would recommend, uh, but there are a lot of others. And if you visit our website, kissalaska.com, I'm sure many of you have spent a little bit of time there. Um, we'll have a list of excursions that we recommend in each port. And then really, I think the most important thing is to know that Everybody who works for John Hall's Alaska, and this is something that John Sr. Uh, set in place many moons ago. Uh, if you're gonna work for his organization, you, you need to go and visit and witness and experience it, touch it, taste it, and smell it for yourself. So that when uh, someone from Indianapolis, Indiana calls and has a question about Alaska, you're not reading from a book. Uh, you're, you're speaking from personal experience. And I think that that's uh, really important when it comes to the preparation for uh, for these tours. So if you have a question about an excursion, please call the office, uh, please email the office. Our team is happy to assist you in, in your planning for those cruises. Excuse me. Uh, another question that we often get is, um, you know, what's the best way to cruise? Uh, first and foremost, I will say, it is not by coincidence that when you look at the John Hall product line, and of course all the other products in the marketplace, Celebrity, Royal Caribbean, Holland America, Princess, uh, the primary fashion in which we operate our tours is in a north to south fashion. Uh, we like to get guests into the interior, uh, have them touch it, taste it, smell it, feel it. They're on more of a structured schedule, if you will, from day to day. They've got some early mornings, you've got some late nights, but then the nice thing is you get on that cruise ship, you get to relax and reflect and rejuvenate for seven days as you go south. Uh, I am not a big fan of cruising northbound. And I've read things over the years that I've been involved with the industry where people say, you know, ease your way into your vacation. Uh, start with a seven day cruise. Well, when you start in Vancouver, of course, and you're heading north to Alaska, it's one hour uh, earlier, sorry, one hour uh, later in Vancouver. So you're losing an hour as you come uh, or gain an hour as you come north. So suddenly when you get off your, uh, your cruise ship and you're ready to start your land tour, uh, let's say you disembark in Whittier and your first date takes you up to Denali. Well, the next day might be your wildlife adventure. And if your wildlife adventure uh, is gonna depart at 6 a.m., which many of them do, that means of course you're getting up at 4.30 or five to get ready for to have breakfast and get ready for that tour. And it's hard to adjust from cruise life where you slept and dined and danced when you wanted to now having a schedule. So our Recommendation for those doing a land and cruise or a cruise tour as they're sometimes referred to, uh, get the long flight out of the way and then you know, work your way south and, and kind of reflect and relax as you head back to Vancouver. Uh, now, again, this is all relative and to each their own. Um, I understand and love and appreciate what the uh, cruise industry has done for Alaska. I don't know how many Alaska cruises I've taken in my life, but it's been a blessing to probably do 25 or 30. I met my wife on uh, one of Holland America's cruise ships in July of 2005. So a lot of great memories uh, sailing the inside passage with the, with the big cruise ships. Uh, for me, the inside passage is everything. I'm one who really takes in the culture and the wildlife and the scenery. Uh, more than anything else. Even on a large vessel, you'll find me out on the deck of the vessel, scanning the beaches, looking for bears or eagles along the way. So from my standpoint, I think the smaller the boat, the better in many ways. Because uh, nowadays, of course, you look at the size of these ships that are sailing into Alaska, uh, 25, 35, 4,500, 5,000 passengers. I think we had a couple that pushed that 5,000 mark uh, this last year, again, to 2019, that first came into Alaska. And, and they're wonderful. They have a ton of amenities and a lot of attractions and activities, and they're great for multi-generational families. Um, and like I said, the service and, and food on board is, is hard to match. Uh, but when you see the routes that the ships, the, 
the true routes that these ships have to sail to get into places like Skagway and Juneau, you know, a lot of their time is actually spent out in the Gulf of Alaska in the open ocean because they can't sail the true inside passage which passes through this route right here. Uh, therefore, I really lend a lot of my credit and, and love of Alaska's inside passage and Southeast Alaska in general uh, to operators like Alaska Dream Cruises. Uh, these are real Alaskans showing people real Alaska. And uh, it goes beyond uh, Ketchikan and Juneau and Skagway. Uh, there's a lot of destinations, Sitka being probably my favorite city in the state. It uh, once was the capital of Alaska, known as New Archangel when Russia owned it. Uh, but some incredible uh, cultural experiences and cake. Uh, if you want to learn about the, the fishing industry and the Norwegian settlement of Petersburg, uh, same thing with Wrangell and, and the beautiful glacier experiences there. Uh, these true inside passage cruises, as I, I like to call them, are, are comforting in, in many ways. Uh, and of course, there's, a, there's an advantage when it comes to the, the wildlife and scenery along the way. And I think the best way for me to, to show you that example is just do a side by side of, uh, this is the MS Zondam in Holland America. Um, if I remember correctly, that's about a 1700 passenger vessel. And uh, this is the Baranoff Dream with Alaska Dream Cruises. That's about a 46 passenger vessel. So you can imagine the areas that this vessel can get into that this one would only dream of. So again, a little different approach to, to sailing Southeast Alaska and something I recommend, especially for those that have been to Alaska before, uh, maybe you wanna consider a small ship adventure. And I know uh, everybody's heard of Viking and the wonderful product that they put into the marketplace across the globe. And they really promote that small ship experience, cultural rich experience. Um, to me, I don't think there's a destination better suited for small vessels than Alaska. And, and again, the highlights along the way, a visit to native villages like Cake, uh, where you'll meet uh, a gentleman, Joe, here, who happens to be carving and doing a demonstration of uh, not only how to carve a totem, but what the meaning behind those totems are. Uh, the raven, the eagle clans, uh, of course, the story that's told as you read from top to bottom uh, within that, uh, that beautiful handmade uh, piece of art. And then again, the, the wildlife. It's... Uh, Almost every day is a whale watching adventure when you're on the small vessels. Uh, it's not something that you have to add in, uh, to the cost of your tour. It's just part of the daily uh, routine as you sail uh, between places like Wrangell and Petersburg or Cape. And again, uh, just an example of, of places that they can visit. Of course, another question that we oftentimes get uh, about any cruise, not just in Alaska, but primarily here, uh, will I get seasick? Uh, Again, going back to the previous uh, mentioned and highlighted uh, cruise product, this, the small ship cruises of Alaska Dream Cruises, um, or the smaller uh, catamaran style trips through the inside passage, uh, those offer a level of protection because, because of the inside passage, the islands actually protect you from um, storms and waves that might be coming out of the Gulf of Alaska. Uh, but we also get a fair amount of people that uh, want to visit Alaska in six or seven days on a ship is just not their cup of tea beyond the idea that maybe they, they're just not comfortable in terms of motion to the ocean. Uh, so there are options available for those that are they're interested in coming to Alaska and witnessing the glaciers and witnessing the, the marine wildlife. And uh, the one that I point to most often is Prince William Sound. Of course, this is one of the uh, most prominent places in Alaska. Uh, a lot of people, of course, first heard about Prince William Sound uh, because of the uh, March 1989 uh, Exxon Valdez. Uh, it has recovered beautifully since the Exxon Valdez. It's one of the richest ecosystems in Alaska. And uh, for a number of years uh, on tours that we've been running between Whittier and Valdez uh, or Valdez and Cordova, uh, these trips come very close into overall ratings uh, for visitors to Alaska um, that meet or measure up to what Denali is putting forth. And we'll talk about Denali in a little bit, but uh, this is a marine wildlife uh, wonderland, if you will. And that kind of leads into the, the next question that we often get is, you know, what's the best time to see the marine wildlife? Uh, how about the birds and, and the whales? Uh, again, places like Kenai Fjords National Park, Prince William Sound, uh, they retain a number of different species throughout the year. Uh, we do have migratory birds uh, that will... Uh, 
primarily migrate earlier in the in the summer, uh, mid to late May is when like our shorebird festivals take place. Uh, the the kitty winks that you see here, uh, there's a large migration of those birds heading north toward the Arctic in May, and then they're coming back uh, in September. When it comes to the uh, sea otters and sea lions, uh, they will reside here in Alaska uh, throughout the year. Uh, in fact, one of the reasons that the uh, the uh, oil line terminates in Valdez, it's the uh, northernmost ice-free port in North America. So a lot of these animals like the, uh, the sea, sea otter that you see here, they will come in and call this area home and they'll spend, uh, spend their, their winters uh, right there in the waters of Prince William Sound and, and Valdez Arm. When it comes to the whales, um, of course the, wild, the whales are migratory species as well, but a uh, little known fact about them is, is really the only uh, population of whales to migrate out of Alaska during the fall and into the winter is, is the adult whales. Uh, the juvenile whales uh, will stay in Alaska year round. So certainly better opportunity to see whales May, June, July, August, and into that early part of September. Uh, that's kind of our, our arch for peak season. Uh, but really, you could you could travel to Alaska right now and have a chance to see a humpback whale, especially in the Inside Passage near uh, in Glacier Bay, uh, Frederick Sound, very popular areas for seeing the, the humpback whales. Uh, but of course, orcas as well, which we'll see in, in again, Kenai Fjords and, uh, and Prince William Sound. Uh, this chart just gives you a, a a real good example as to why we're so confident in people's opportunities to see the whales in Alaska. Uh, and this charts the whale population um, back as far as the mid 1980s uh, through the middle part of the 20 teens. And uh, you just see that massive spike that started to take place right around the year 2000, 2001. Uh, the numbers are, are great. Uh, and again, it's, it's, it's one of those things, the advantage I would say to smaller vessels, a little more time, putting the focus on, on the wildlife, that's gonna increase your opportunity. Um, if, if you travel by a uh, large vessel into a city like Juneau, one of the, rec one of the uh, excursions that I always recommend people participate in is that of the Juneau Wildlife and Whale Quest. Uh, that's actually operated by a family, uh, the Allen Marine family, and they are the largest day boat operator uh, in the world. Uh, in fact, uh, all they do all summer is, is move people around uh, different parts of Alaska, Southeast Alaska, and they know where those whales are at. And uh, it's a pretty awesome product they put together. But uh, you know, if you have that opportunity to see it on a daily basis, uh, it never gets old. Another often asked question that relates uh, to the cruise, but not only just the, the cruise products in Alaska is uh, will we see glaciers? Uh, absolutely. Uh, Every cruise that goes to Alaska that sails the Inside Passage will give you the opportunity to see uh, the glaciers in Hubbard Glacier and Yakutak Bay, maybe Marjorie Glacier in Glacier Bay. Um, if you're really, really lucky, you get a chance to go see John Hopkins Glacier in Glacier Bay. Uh, Tracy Arm and the Twin Sawyer Glaciers is oftentimes highlighted, but every one of those seven day cruises uh, will feature a glacier at some point. And you'll spend approximately 35 to 45 minutes in front of that glacier, watching for it to calf, that ice breaking loose and crumbling into the water. Uh, the one thing I have to recommend, and I don't have a slide to show this, is how powerful that calving can be. Uh, and I, I really do recommend that you, we'll talk about packing in a little bit, put your layers on, put your mittens and hat on, step outside. Um, it, it's gonna be cool out on the deck of that vessel. When you've got all that ice, it brings the air temperature down substantially. Uh, if it's 35 or 40 degrees on the deck of that vessel, it won't matter when that ice crumbles into the water below. It will send a shock wave that will vibrate and make the hair on the back of your neck stand up. Uh, there's a reason that the, the native people to Alaska refer to that as the white thunder. Uh, it does sound like a thunderstorm as it crashes down. And, and from the water level here to the top of that glacier, uh, this is the Mears Glacier in Prince William Sound, uh, that's about 300 feet in elevation. So sometimes you're seeing uh, a 15 or 20 story building crumble into the water uh, and, and the concussion that that creates and the wave that it creates is awesome. Just really, really impressive. Uh, other glaciers, uh, the small boat adventures, again, Prince William Sound, Kenai Fjords uh, highlight, uh, like I said, glaciers like uh, the, the uh, Columbia Glacier, uh, the fastest moving glacier in Alaska today. But there's also opportunities to see glaciers on 
interior programs of Alaska. Most of these glaciers are going to be located in the central to south central portion of the state. Um, so places like Anchorage and Palmer Wassell of the Matanuska Valley over to Valdez. Valdez itself is surrounded by uh, 26 glaciers. Um, Homer, Alaska is a fabulous place. It's my, my wife's favorite city in the state. And it too is surrounded by a, a number of beautiful glaciers. We call these hanging glaciers or alpine glaciers like you see in the uh, picture here. But these inland or valley glaciers, uh, like you see here, this is the Matanuska Glacier. You know, we'll actually have a chance on uh, different itineraries or if you're traveling through Alaska by RV or taking your rental car and traveling through Alaska, the Glen Highway. Uh, this picture is taken right around August 25th, I would say maybe September 1st, uh, just comes to life as you travel along the rivers and through the valley and eventually up onto the Matanuska Glacier here. Uh, this is, like I said, the largest inland glacier left in the state today. Another question that we get, and this one is again, hard for me to, to answer, uh, is when's the best time to visit? And of course, as, as an ambassador to Alaska, uh, it's my job to tell you that there isn't a bad time. You know, we can leave January 1st and come back December 31st and it's gonna be spectacular. And it will be, uh, and you'll see a number of different seasons, a witness, uh, a number of different cultures and uh, have a number of different experiences along the way. Um, I think from the standpoint of summertime visits, which again, I said, start right around the second week of May uh, through again, the second week of September. Uh, each season has its, its plus, uh, starting with late May and into early June. Uh, I will say cruising is fine in early May. I'm not as prone to recommend sending you to the interior of Alaska in a place like Denali in early to mid-May. Um, I grew up in Minnesota and I can't tell you how many times we had snowfall around Mother's Day. They said, don't plant your garden before Mother's Day. Um, in Alaska, it's actually Memorial Day. You really don't wanna plant your garden and put the flowers in until after Memorial Day. So there's a couple week difference there. Uh, but by the end of May, by that Memorial time frame. Uh, what we're seeing for the first time are these new little blessings to life, uh, like the moose calf or the caribou calf or the doll sheep ewe that's been dropped. So late May and into June is a, is a fantastic time. Plus, we're getting some warmer, longer days. Uh, we'll touch on weather here in just a little bit. July and through the early part of August, uh, this is our, our flower season. Uh, you'll see massive cabbages in different destinations through the interior. Of course, the Matanuska Valley, uh, part of the New Deal. Uh, and uh, they can grow some incredible vegetables there. If you can imagine 80, 85 pound cabbages and 10 pound carrots and 12 pound squash, uh, that's the rich fertile farmland uh, filled by the, uh, the glacier sediment left behind. Uh, but of these particular flowers that you see here, uh, this is actually the provincial flower of the Yukon territory, uh, or I should say the territorial flower of the Yukon. Uh, it is called fireweed. And it generally comes to bloom right around the first part of July. It's very intense in late July. And then as summer comes to a close or starts to wind down, uh, these petals will actually start to fold up and drop. And as they uh, become a solid red stem, that indicates to us that uh, general rule of thumb, we have about uh, six weeks left before winter might be on our doorstep. So uh, the fireweed is magnificent through the state uh, and in also into the Yukon, of course, as well. Alaska wanted to claim this flower as its uh, state flower, uh, but since the Yukon had done it prior, um, we were left with the forget-me-not, uh, which is a beautiful blue and gold flower, uh, tiny little flower that you'll see throughout the, your, your tra travels in the interior. Late August and into September, uh, for my money, for my personal feelings on, on Alaska and the things that really make me tick uh, and get me excited about the idea of visiting, uh, this particular time frame happens to be my favorite. Uh, what I love about late August into September, right around August 20th, we start to see the fall color setting in in Alaska. Uh, generally by about September 1st or September 2nd, Denali is getting its peak change in fall color, fall foliage. Uh, and it's very different from the foliage that, that uh, I grew up with in Minnesota, or if you've ever been to Nova Scotia, New England, Nova Scotia, or to uh, the Great Smoky Mountains and seen the fall colors there. Of course, those are in the hardwood trees and, and it's gorgeous. In Alaska, the big change actually happens in the tundra, uh, especially as you're up 
into Denali and what's now known as the subarctic of Alaska. Uh, all the dwarf plants and berry plants change from the green to this very vibrant red and orange. And that landscape is dominated by, by these plants. And then you get the green and the white on the mountains from the snow and a blue sky. And it really sets up to be uh, a pretty spectacular sight. Uh, the other thing that I love about fall is we're into the mating season of these animals. Um, now the grizzly bears and the brown bears, they actually mate in June, uh, where the other big four that we'll talk about, the, uh, the sheep, the caribou, the moose, and the wolf, uh, they have their mating season in the, in the fall months, in autumn. So as, as that rut or that mating season starts to, uh, to come upon us, you tend to see a little bit more wildlife. Um, just because the, the natural movement and, and uh, the desires, I guess, of, of these animals as they uh, venture out to find their mate. Another advantage to September, and if we're talking about shoulder seasons and, and, and in Alaska tourism, uh, there's always a, a bit of an arch, July being kind of the peak season, the prime time to visit Alaska. Of course, for many people that are traveling as families, July works because the kids get out of school in June and maybe have to go back to school in August nowadays. Uh, weddings and everything else happen, graduations in June. So July tends to be peak. Of course, the temperatures are as warm as they get in, in July. So that tends to be a, a hot spot. Um, as you shoulder off of that June and then May or August and September, um, if I had to pick between the two, far and away again, my shoulder season of choice is gonna be September for the reasons uh, stated, the, the fall colors, the rut, and then the opportunity now to see the Aurora Borealis. Uh, because of our long days, 18, 19, 20, 21 hours of daylight, uh, in Fairbanks, for example, they'll get more than 21 hours of daylight on the 21st of June, the solstice. And that means that the sun sets around, oh, 1.30 in the morning and is up by four o'clock. Uh, so uh, a whopping three to four hours of, we'll call it twilight, it's not even darkness. Uh, so as you get later into the summer, right from about mid-August, 15th to 20th onward, now we have an opportunity to see the aurora, uh, something that's there year round, but because of the amount of daylight, uh, it's not always, uh, always visible to, to the travelers. And when it comes to those summertime temperatures, this is certainly something that will drive a person's decision. Uh, we've learned this over the years. People want to know when, again, when's the best month to go? When's the best weather? Uh, the one thing I, I, I will say about that, it depends. It's kind of like uh, having grown up in Minnesota. Uh, I played golf on April 1st a lot of years. And on April 15th, the course was closed because we got 18 inches of snow. Uh, not to that extreme in Alaska summer, but you, you can certainly have that. Uh, there are times in Alaska, especially in the interior, uh, and I know this is very odd, but if you think about looking at a map and you see the city of Anchorage, our biggest city, uh, this is their average temperature uh, throughout the summer, 60, 65, 63, 64, but 400 miles north of Anchorage is the city of Fairbanks. And Fairbanks on average is gonna be about seven to 10 degrees warmer uh, during the month of June and July. So we will have days that it's 80, 85, 90 degrees. Uh, so when we get again to the packing segment, um, how do I pack for Alaska? Layers, be comfortable, be casual with layers because you're gonna have days, especially if you're in the shoulder season of August, September, you, know, you can wake up and have 40 degrees, 35 degrees, a little frost on the, on the ground, but in the afternoon, it's gonna be 50 to 55, maybe 60 degrees. So you won't need the, the extra layers. You can shed those off as you travel. Uh, and even our farthest reaches of the, of, of the state and the farthest northernmost point in North America, uh, Barrow, uh, you'll see in July, and that's when we choose to visit uh, Barrow with our, our uh, National Parks Program, uh, they're up to a whopping uh, 47 degrees on average. Uh, we've, we've had groups on our national park program go into Barrow and have snow showers in July. Um, it's not uh, the place for me, but uh, there are 5,000 very proud people who live there and it's their home and it'll always be their home uh, is the great city of Barrow. Now, one of the things that, that I always, of course, try to prepare people on is again, not just the, the temperatures, but the rainfall. Uh, that comes in Alaska. The interior of Alaska is very dry, uh, very dry climate. I remember when I first moved there in 2005, uh, I was getting bloody noses because the air was so dry, waking up in the middle of the night. Uh, Anchorage only gets about 16 inches of rain annually. 
Uh, again, 400 miles to the north, uh, Fairbanks gets less than 12. So really Fairbanks is almost a desert-like climate. Uh, it gets less rain than Phoenix, Arizona gets. Uh, our rainy months in the interior uh, tend to be July and into August and then a little bit in September. But when I say rainy months, we're looking at maybe inch and a half to two to a little bit over two and a half inches um, in a month's time frame. So the interior uh, advantage there, much drier climate, better weather obviously for flight scene and viewing the animals and seeing Denali, which we'll get to here shortly. The inside passage uh, tends to be a little bit more rainy, a little bit more wet. Uh, this area known as the Tongass National Forest, uh, the largest national forest in the US, uh, a lot of that is actually rainforest. Uh, the city of Sitka gets about 85 inches of rain annually. Uh, Juneau, the state capital, gets about 75 inches of rain annually. And Ketchikan, uh, this is the winter, winter check-in dinner right here. Uh, Ketchikan, you can see in the month of September, gets more rainfall than the city of Fairbanks gets in an entire year. Uh, annually, Ketchikan will see about 160 inches or 300 days worth of rainfall. Uh, it's not a heavy downpour. Uh, it's not like those uh, Midwest storms that come across the Rockies and dump a bunch of rain on the fertile farmlands. Uh, you get these overcast, misty days where it rains for 20 minutes and stops and rains for 20 minutes and stops, but that happens day in and day out for you know 300 days a year. So. Uh, the CVB in, in Ketchikan uh, likes to call it liquid sunshine. Uh, and again, you just remember you're on vacation. You're enjoying the adventure. Uh, too many people hang their head and walk to the rain, and kick the mud, and uh, they're not embracing it. And I think if you go into it and understand that, hey, we're in a, we're in a rainforest, that makes uh, the visit to the Inside Passage so much uh, better and so much more enjoyable. Funny enough, uh, as much as I love August, September in Alaska, and really I love all the months, uh, February and March have become one of my favorite times to visit the state. It's a, it's a different look. It's kind of a look behind the veil of, of what Alaska is really like. Uh, during the summer with the large volumes of people traveling in and out, I think residents tend to be a little bit more guarded. And in the winter, um, you know, they're more apt to in, have you come into their home and enjoy a cup of coffee or hot cocoa and, and, and learn about life in Alaska. So again, if you're not afraid of putting your foot out there and trying something a little bit different, I would highly recommend visiting Alaska in the winter. Um, and the temperatures aren't as bad as they might sound or you might read. Um, and I know you're going to think this is interesting when I say it, but uh, Fairbanks is a dry cold, much like Phoenix is a dry hot. Uh, that, that dry cold air uh, feels so different from that moist air that, that I grew up with in Minnesota. Uh, 25 below in Minnesota, just you didn't want to go anywhere. Um, I've been outside watching the Aurora at 25 below in Fairbanks and thought nothing of it for two or three hours. Of course, you pack accordingly. Uh, you've got the heavier down jackets that are rated to 40 or 50 below. You've got the mittens, the hats, the long johns, uh, and, you, and, and you just kind of hub and spoke every day uh, where you, you're not forced to be out in the temperatures for long, uh, long stretches. Now, as you see, uh, this is for Fairbanks, the average temperatures in uh, February and March. Yes, the average low in February is negative 12 with the average high of around 11. Uh, in March here, we're minus four. This is on uh, Celsius, of course, and then uh, 25 Fahrenheit on the high side, which would be uh, which would be pretty comparable to about, I'd say, 35 in, in Minnesota, uh, especially as we get into March, we're getting those longer days. Uh, now we're up to 12, 13 hours, depending on what time of March, if you catch the, uh, the time change, uh, we're gonna be somewhere around 13 hours of, of daylight at that point in March. So we're starting to get some, some longer days as we come out of January into February and then March. And March, of course, uh, brings a lot of excitement to Alaska. This is for a lot of, a lot of our visitors, if we're focusing on a winter tour to Alaska, you know, what can we do? Uh, what, are, what activities are unique to Alaska that would get me excited about visiting this destination? Well, it starts with the Iditarod. The first uh, Saturday in March, the Iditarod runs its uh, ceremonial start on Fourth Avenue in Anchorage, Alaska. There's probably 100,000 people that lines the street of Anchorage and watch these mushers come out of the chute every two minutes, uh, a lot of cheering. And then the next day on Sunday, up in Willow, Alaska is the official start of this race. 
And that's the start for, of this 1100 mile race. And I, I like to call it the world's longest tailgate because you'll see people on teams of uh, four wheelers and snow machines or snowmobiles as we call them, uh, running out on the trail 10, 20, 30 miles and also dragging a barbecue grill behind them and a cooler. And they'll sit out there all afternoon on Sunday cheering these mushers as they, as they come up the trail and work their way towards uh, Nome, Alaska. Other adventures that are, again, unique to Alaska's winter, uh, flight scene. March is a spectacular time for flight scene because the, uh, the precipitation is low, skies are clear, uh, so there's an advantage there. I always feel like Denali itself is bigger in the winter, uh, and I think, of course, it has something to do with the amount of snow on there, but those clear skies certainly help with that. And then not only can you land near a glacier, but you can actually walk up to these glaciers uh, and see those intense blues like the Knick Glacier uh, outside of Anchorage. Of course, if you're in Alaska in the winter and we're talking about Iditarod programs, well, then you definitely have to go uh, for a run on a dog sled. Uh, you can do this uh, in Fairbanks. is a very common place for people to participate in that activity. And then for those that have never done it or those who have just thoroughly enjoy it, of course, the opportunity to ride some snowmobiles. Uh, it's always fun when we get a group from Texas or Florida or Arizona who've never been on a snowmobile before, but they want to try it. Uh, a little bit like driving a boat at times, I guess. Uh, but it's a, a great experience to have. And there you also see the Alaska pipeline that runs uh, from Prudhoe Bay down through Fairbanks and onto Valdez. So a neat highlight when you're outside of Fairbanks on those uh, snow machines. And then of course, who doesn't love a good snowball fight? Uh, what I wanna show you actually in this picture, uh, this is a, a photo that uh, one of our guests sent us a couple, a couple winters ago. Uh, this is the Alaska range in the background. This picture is taken from Talkeetna, which is on the south side of Denali near Denali State Park. Uh, as the crow flies, we're about 85 miles uh, to that mountain. That is the great one, Denali, 20,310 feet, uh, the highest point in North America. Of course, over here you have Foraker, uh, the second highest mountain in that range, and then Moose's Tooth. Uh, stunning picture on a clear day. And as I said, they just feel a little bit bigger in the winter. But to me, uh, if you're looking for a true Alaskan religious experience, come in March and spend at least a week and enjoy these opportunities. Uh, I took this picture three years ago from that same location where that snowball fight was taking place. And this was about two o'clock in the morning. Um, the aurora that was coming off uh, the north face of the Alaska range made it so bright and so intense that you can actually see Mount McKinley or Denali as it's known, the true name, 80 miles away at two o'clock in the morning in complete darkness. It backlit that range so beautifully. Uh, there again is Fork or Moose's Tooth. So if you're interested in seeing Northern Lights, I, I mentioned earlier, you could start to see them in mid to late August, uh, but if you really want to get into it and have a, a, a pretty much a guaranteed opportunity, uh, go spend three, four, five nights in Fairbanks in March um, or Denali or down here in Talkeetna. Uh, these are the best places to be. Uh, get the clearer skies, obviously, that time of year. Uh, and then uh, with the equinox, we tend to get a little higher increase in our aurora activity. And something we would recommend, I have these on my phone, a couple of apps to help you kind of predict when the aurora is going to come out. Uh, generally speaking, you have to stay up late. Um, the winter tours that we operate, they function a little bit differently. You're up late and you sleep in, you know, you sleep uh, the morning away and you get up and have brunch and then move on uh, as you prepare for a late evening, maybe take a nap in between. And then you go up to some of these Aurora viewing places or your hotel that you're staying at uh, around 10, 30, 11 o'clock at night and stay up until two or three. Uh, and, it, and it happens so quickly. You just, you never really know when it's going to come upon you, but it's, but it's awesome when it does. And so these apps will kind of prepare you for anticipated time, clarity in the sky, uh, moisture, static electricity, everything that plays into uh, those solar flares coming through our atmosphere and creating those. And then of course, more than anything, you actually have to have clear skies. Uh, you know, I've, I've had times where I've been in Alaska and we know the Northern Lights are raging uh, in September, but it's cloudy and the cloud cover doesn't allow for that. So another app that we recommend is the uh, clear, clear dark sky charts, uh, just so you can of course monitor those two, the activity and then what the skies are gonna look like. Now, how do I prepare and pack for an Alaska trip? Another very often asked question. Uh, and it's 
it, it's more specific than one would think for us anyway. Um, obviously, you pack differently for a trip in June than you would July or August. Uh, and of course, very differently if you're going up in September. Um, we have uh, on our website uh, lists and of course at our, our home office, um, kind of the, the bullet points, the main items that you wanna make sure you have when you prepare for an Alaska trip uh, in the summer months, for example. But as our clients prepare for uh, their tour, they'll actually get a more specific uh, itinerary-based packing list. Um, obviously, if you were traveling with us on our Denali Explorer in the month of June, again, you're going to pack differently than the people who are traveling on our Three Bears of Alaska trip in September, where they're going to be flying to the Arctic coast and uh, viewing the polar bears. So uh, we'll get pretty specific uh, to the particular itinerary. Uh, same being said with the, uh, the winter program, uh, and again, temperatures average uh, listed there. We, uh, we do supply winter jackets to our clients, uh, to our visitors on these winter programs. And then there are companies that will actually do rental equipment for you in Alaska when it comes to the boots and the snow pants. Uh, because of course, again, if you're coming from Texas, not a whole lot of need for snow boots, uh, but maybe for this one week trip to the Great Land. Uh, back into one of my favorite topics, it's wildlife. Wildlife certainly makes me, makes me tick. And I, I remember when I first went to Alaska in 1985, at the age of seven, my dad read me a book uh, called Alaska Bear Tax. And uh, I don't think I slept very well for a week. I, I wanted to lock the cabin and make sure that in Tokyo, no bear could get into our room. I don't think my mother would have been very happy that he was reading that to me. But uh, uh, there are, of course, a number of, of bears in Alaska, different species from the brown bear uh, to the polar bear to the black bear. Uh, grizzlies, really a subspecies. It's, it's kin of the, the brown bear. They're the same bear, just different diets. Uh, the great thing about Alaska, especially May through September, there's always opportunities to see bears. Uh, the brown bears, for example, or our grizzly bears, uh, they're one and the same. Like I said, the difference is the grizzly bears are in the interior here. They're a little bit smaller. The brown bears tend to travel through the coastal regions and have access to that salmon. So they grow to be a little bit bigger, going from maybe six or 700 pounds up to now 11, 12, 1300 pounds are these brown bears. But again, just an example for um, trips that you can take right out of Anchorage. If you're a bear enthusiast and you want to come in a couple of days early and fly out to see some of these uh, hallowed grounds of, of, of bear territory, whether it's Brooks Camp, which I'll highlight in just a moment, that's the most iconic, Hallow Bay, Geographic Harbor. Uh, these are all fantastic locations to go and see the bears. And, and like I said, from the time they come out of their hibernation in May through September, there are opportunities uh, throughout the state to, to witness bears. Uh, this is the one that gets the accolades, the, the one that's probably promoted the most. In fact, I've seen this picture used to promote bears in Denali. Um, and I guess that they're brown bears, uh, but they're certainly not uh, chasing salmon like these uh, big brown bears are down in Katmai National Park, and that's Brooks Falls. Uh, the month of July brings the salmon run, and therefore that's why these approximately 70 to 80 bears uh, migrate into this area um, along the Katmai coast, and they spend their time just hanging out in the water and chasing those sockeye salmon around. Uh, I, I've been to uh, Brooks Falls a couple of times, and most often on a, on a visit out here where you spend maybe six or seven hours at the falls, I would say on average, a, a visitor probably sees eight or nine of these big brown bears in the water. I've seen as many as 22 or 23. And some of my more interesting encounters with the bears actually happen on the trail, uh, walking to and from the falls. Uh, I think that that can be just as exciting as actually seeing the bears catch the salmon in person there. Other bears, um, of course, the polar bears. Uh, I think for a lot of people uh, that are targeting our three bears of Alaska adventure, uh, the idea of going to the North Slope of Alaska and coming encounter with one of these massive uh, big boys is a, a pretty special adventure. Uh, like I said, we, we actually take guests up to Kaktovik on our three bears of Alaska right around the first week of September each year. And the reason these polar bears are here, there's about 80 polar bears that live out on the uh, Breaker Islands uh, off, off of Barger Island or Kaktovik. Uh, very large, very high seal population here, uh, year round basis. So these, these polar bears hang out here close to Kaktovik uh, throughout the year. But in late August and into September, that's when they have their whaling season. And those polar bears, of course, like to chew on the remains of those bowhead whales that the natives ha harvest. And uh, they'll come in a little bit closer and a little bit closer and a little bit closer to those villages and uh, give us a, an up close look 
Um, we'll, we'll actually view these polar bears two different ways, by land on a, on a bus or van, and then you'll actually get in small boats and go out in these breaker waters uh, through, through the breaker islands here and get up close uh, and, and take pictures like that. Of course, Alaska is a outdoorsman's paradise, a fisherman's paradise. Uh, I often have uh, conversations with my neighbor when he comes back from Colorado or Montana about the, the fish that he catches. And I say, well, when are you gonna come to, uh, when are you gonna come to Alaska and catch a real rainbow trout? Um, I have never caught a 30 inch rainbow, but I've seen a fair amount of them caught. And in late August and September, when the salmon are done running, these, uh, trout come up out of the river system, out of the lakes and into the river systems, and they will literally eat all the eggs that are bouncing off the bottom. And they can put on about a pound a week. And I've seen rainbows that measure in diameter uh, 18 to 19 inches around the belly right there. Uh, these are world-class trout for sure. Uh, the rivers like the Naknak and the Jack, and of course the Kenai, the most well-known. Uh, for people who want to fish in the rivers and target the the uh, trout fishing or the salmon runs that happen in the river system. Uh, it starts in May, really our peak runs for the salmon, June and July. Uh, the last run of the salmon is the silver salmon. They'll actually enter the water systems uh, late to mid-August and into early September. Uh, but for those that love to catch the, uh, the trout, the Dolly Varden, the rainbows like I showed there, actually later is better. And like I said, after those salmon now have all spawned out, that's when those uh, Rainbow trout and Dolly Varden love to fill their bellies with those uh, salmon eggs floating down the river. Um, now the, the regulations on the waterways, uh, stream or river versus salt water are very different. And, and something I always encourage people, uh, whether you're driving yourself to Alaska in an RV uh, or you're flying up with a group of friends, make sure you pay attention to the regulations. And really my recommendation is get yourself a good guide. Uh, because the Game and Fish Department in Alaska is probably the strongest uh, department in the state of Alaska. And uh, they will literally close down sections or east or west bank of the river uh, during the middle of the night. And uh, you know, they, they have uh, such regulations as you can fish with artificial bait on Wednesdays and you have to fish with uh, bobbers and a worm on Tuesdays. No, that's, that's a little bit of an exaggeration, but um, certainly want to make sure you know what you're getting into before you start fishing because uh, they definitely care and love their assets and resources and they protect them in Alaska. Uh, deep sea fishing for me growing up was not that exciting. The first time I caught a halibut, I thought I was reeling a, uh, a flat barn door off the bottom of the ocean. Uh, when you catch a hundred pound halibut and bring it up to the, to the surface and they swim flat like that, it's, a, it's quite a struggle for a, for a young man or woman. Uh, but I will say over time, um, I've come to really appreciate fishing in Southeast Alaska and outside of Seward, Alaska, uh, outside of Kenai Fjords. This is some of the best fishing in the world, not just for the halibut, for the salmon. Um, you see here again on this chart, we have king salmon that are in the waters getting ready to run into those rivers uh, in May, June, July. Uh, the silver salmon come a little bit later. The chums and pinks, uh, the pinks run every other year. Uh, the chums will come in there uh, July and into August. And really from, from a deep sea standpoint, halibut fishing is, is really good from, from May till September. It'll tail off uh, by mid to late September. And then some other great, uh, like the rockfish, a lingcod along the way. And the wonderful thing with the fishing in Alaska is uh, if you do it right, uh, go in and spend a couple of days in Seward and do some fishing or go to Sitka and do some fishing. Uh, you can have all that fish processed uh, packed up, individually wrapped, and you can either take that home on the plane with you or you can have that uh, sent home once you return uh, to your home city. What highlights should I not miss when it comes to Alaska? Well, we'd be here all night if I got into that. I'd say all of them. Um, but really, something I learned many, many moons ago uh, when John Sr. first gave me the opportunity to develop some of these Alaska itineraries I thought how wonderful would it be if we paid more attention, attention to some of the other national parks uh, like Wrangell St. Elias. And for people who have been to Alaska before, well, maybe going to Denali isn't, uh, isn't that important. Well, I was wrong. Denali is absolutely, uh, even for those that have been there five, six, seven times, a must. And, and time made me open my eyes and realize why. Uh, again, much like Prince William Sound, every day is different in Denali. And there isn't a place 
in Alaska that I found where you have this concentration of the different species of animals in the mountain range and the subarctic uh, atmosphere and ecosystem like Denali. So whether it's our, our moose, our caribou that you see here, our sheep, uh, this guy right here uh, is actually the reason that Denali exists. Uh, a gentleman named Charles Sheldon pushed for the protection of the doll sheep. And in 1917, Denali became a national park, Alaska's first national park. So uh, we, I love seeing these doll sheep. They're just very majestic. And you can, you can see a hundred doll sheep a day. Um, of course, some of them will be three miles away and they're little white spots in the mountain, but hopefully you'll have an opportunity to, uh, to see one up close like this. And of course the bears, the grizzly bears. Uh, I, I just get rave reviews from people who come back from say, John, going to Denali and going to Kansas worthwhile so worth the time and the investment uh you know we saw 20 or 25 or 30 bears and you know the more time you spend the deeper you go and travel the better encounter and the experience that's going to be especially when it comes to denali and that's something i think uh, we at john halls alaska recognize uh denali is a huge asset but it has to be done right uh I've talked to people who said Denali was not their favorite destination, or they, they actually reviewed it quite poorly. Um, and it wasn't their fault. Uh, they probably purchased a package uh, that was operated by a major tour operator. Uh, they read the, the details of the itinerary. It was filled with a bunch of flowery adjectives. It sounded great. And when they came to Denali, uh, they were put on a bus with 40, 50, 60 other people, and they tra traveled in on one of three tours. Now, those who are uh, most likely disappointed with their Denali experience, um, it would be this 29 mile tour, starts at the park entrance, comes in on a private park bus, and 29 miles in, 29 miles back out, about four hours in length. That is called the Denali Natural History Tour. Uh, from my standpoint, I think from my whole family standpoint, uh, this, is, this is a particular tour that we would encourage you to maybe find a different itinerary that includes at minimum the next adventure when it comes to Denali. Uh, and, and that's where you see itineraries that include one day and one night in Denali. Most oftentimes those one day, one night stayovers are gonna include this natural history tour. Gives you a, a good history of the park, but the best wildlife viewing really doesn't even start until about mile 30 right here about Teklanika and then continues all the way back past the Isles and Visitor Center here. So at minimum, our recommendation when you're visiting Denali, uh, take the Tundra Wilderness Tour. So make sure when you're reading that itinerary, it says the Tundra Wilderness Tour, or if you drive again your RVs or your rental cars to the uh, Wilderness Access Center, the park headquarters here, uh, get on that bus that's making the, the eight hour journey going in 62 miles. Uh, stopping here at Stony Hill Overlook, incredible view of Denali from this point. You're about 40 miles away from the mountain at that point. Uh, and then, of course, uh, four hours back out, much greater chance to see the moose, the sheep, the caribou, the bear. Uh, now, if you choose to travel with, with our organization to Alaska, uh, everyone who travels with John Halls Alaska will visit Kantishna. This is actually an old mining district. Um, where in 1905, there were about 500 people living back here under the uh, close watchful eye of a gal named Fanny Quigley. And she did run a, a tight camp. Um, of course, this was private land up until the expansion of the park when it became a park and preserve in 1985. So there are a few private properties back here. And we have a number of itineraries that uh, guests will actually spend two nights back here, 92 miles inside the park. So they will travel in on a private bus that uh, holds just our group of 24. We'll come in here 92 miles. We'll spend two nights at this remote wilderness lodge, and then we'll travel 92 miles back out a couple of days later. And that's really a, a nice way to, to take in uh, Denali. Of course, Denali is, is one of eight national parks. And, and again, these are things that I would say you don't want to miss. Now, going to see all eight is a challenge because some of them are, are pretty tough to get to. Um, but one that I love to highlight is, is right here, Wrangell St. Elias National Park. Uh, Wrangell St. Elias, it's about 180 miles to the east of Anchorage. Um, they only get about 65,000 visitors a year, just simply based off of where they're located. Uh, they are the largest park in the U.S. service park systems, 13.1 million acres. Uh, they're home to the uh, Wrangell and St. Elias mountain range, which happen to be home to four of the five highest peaks in North America. So some 
incredible mountain viewing glaciers, tidal rivers of ice that come through uh, the uh, the mountain ranges there. Uh, that's that's really not only an expansive and gorgeous park, Wrangell St. Elias, uh, but it's, it starts right there on the coastal range where the Pacific Plate pushes up against Alaska and created this uh, this massive site known as Wrangell St. Elias. Another one, of course, that I would highly recommend, you know, Kenai Fjords. And the reason I say that is because, again, we know from 40 years now, uh, almost 40 years of operating these Alaska tours, I guess our first trip was 1984, so not quite 40 years, but we're getting there. Uh, the number one draw to Alaska is its glaciers. Alaska has more glaciers than everywhere else in the world combined. Um, there's 100,000 glaciers in Alaska today. Uh, some of them are still advancing. Many of them are retreating. Uh, so whether it's Hubbard Glacier, uh, Knick Glacier, uh, we want you to have some type of a, a glacier experience. And Kenai Fjords is, is one that hits that button as well. Of course, the marine wildlife, to see the whales, to see the humpbacks, the orcas, the sea lions, the sea otters, the puffins, uh, it never gets old. The eagles. Alaska is actually home to half the U.S. population of eagles. Uh, when you travel the inside passage and you see all these beautiful uh, Sitka spruce, these fir trees that's, that come up out of the, the rock and into the sky, which you are looking into that deep green, what you're looking for is your golf ball. If you play golf and you go through the, if you're like me, you hit it in the rough a lot, but you're looking through the rough and you're looking for that little white ball. That's kind of what you're looking for when it comes to these eagles. And uh, there are some up close encounters or opportunities to be had in Southeast Alaska, especially if you go to Sitka and visit the, uh, the Raptor Center there, you'll learn all about these uh, incredible birds of prey. Another thing that I would highly recommend is meet some locals. Spend some time with the Alaskans, those that shovel their, their driveways out in February. Uh, those that I never understood this when I lived there, uh, and especially now uh, that I have two little ones of my own, uh, the families that stay up all night in June. Uh, I've gone on hiking trips uh, after work at nine, 10 o'clock at night and seen families with six and seven and eight year old kids out hiking the trails with me. And I think, uh, shouldn't you be in bed? But you know, meet the locals, hear their story, hear their, their pioneer mannerisms and, and methodology and look at, look at life in Alaska. And then you know, have that connection. Um, obviously dog mushing is huge in Alaska, especially in the winter months. Uh, there's a number of kennels like the Trailbreaker Kennels in Fairbanks, which we love with Mr. Dave Munson, where you get a chance to hold one of those future Iditarod champion dogs and, and, ha and have that uh, emotional connection with the state. Uh, spend time with the natives. Uh, very, very proud people are the Alaska natives. And there's five tribal regions, all of them very different in their languages and methods of hunting and, and food and, and uh, agriculture, if you will. You've got the uh, Clinket uh, Indians in Southeast or the Haida, and then uh, places in the far North, uh, like the, uh, the Yupik or uh, the, the Barrow region. Of course, what else should you not miss? Uh, one thing I always tell people, don't come to Alaska and order the barbecue especially now that I'm married to a Texan and live outside of Austin, Texas myself, I know good barbecue. When you go to Alaska, you want to enjoy the halibut, the salmon, the uh, giant scallops from, from Kodiak, the king crab legs from the Bering Sea. You know, these options are going to be available to you. And I, I highly recommend that, uh, that you take advantage of that. Uh, the seafood is as fresh as it's going to be in any grocery store or any restaurant across the U.S., more fresh, uh, certainly. But if you're not a fan of seafood or you've got allergies to seafood, uh, and this is a question that comes up, what if I don't, if I don't like salmon or halibut? Uh, we would never encourage you to take a tour where every day you eat salmon and prime rib. That gets pretty old, um, especially nowadays. We have a much more sophisticated traveler with a uh, sophisticated palate. They're looking to try unique mom and pop from scratch type cooking. And uh, you'll have those opportunities along the way. There's some incredible restaurants, including one uh, just outside of Denali that's owned and operated by a lady named Chef Laura Cole, who's been nominated now for multiple James Beard Awards. Uh, she runs a restaurant called Parks 229. If you go to Denali and have the opportunity to dine in her restaurant, absolutely. Uh, Highly recommend it. Hopefully you have enough room after they bring the bread to your table because the bread and butter that they start with is enough to fill you up. But even for the more casual travelers, we get multi-generational travelers, of course. Uh, it's a, that's a big part of tourism period. Uh, you know, if you've had steaks and prime rib and, and, and lobster or crab for six nights, maybe, maybe a pizza 
is not a bad idea. And these aren't small pizzas either. Of course, they're Alaskan style. So a lot of great options. And of course, the desserts. You've got uh, some pretty strong heritages here. Uh, there is a sour, sourdough starter in Healy, Alaska that came up with the, uh, the gold miners in 1898. Uh, and it's still the starter today in Rose's Restaurant, just uh, north of Denali in Healy. Uh, she's got some awesome breads, the great family that runs that. But, you know, make sure you save room for dessert. If, if you don't come home from Alaska feeling a little bit more like an Alaskan and ready to take on that Alaskan winter, then you didn't have enough dessert while you were there. And from the standpoint of John Hall's Alaska, from our organization, from our thoughts and feelings and love of the state and, and methodology really that goes into uh, developing, I think, an exquisite and, and top tier and almost, I would say, unmatched uh, group tour product in the state of Alaska. Uh, this map is a great representation as to how and why we are different. Uh, first off, uh, we're going to do a whole lot more than that rail belt, which, of course, is important to Alley. Anchorage, the, the hub of Alaska business, and of course the cruise through the inside passage. Uh, but there's a lot of other routes. There's the uh, Trail of 42, the historic Alaska highway that runs all the way down to Dawson Creek. These pink lines that you see are flights that we'll take with our groups into different remote villages or to Iditarod checkpoints in the winter or to see the bears in Katmai and Kodiak. Uh, the reason that we're able to do this is because we made a decision years ago, John Sr. made a decision, I should say, uh, that he built an organization based on butts and seats. Uh, volume is not the key to success when it comes to Alaska, especially Alaska, because a lot of these little mom and pop operations, uh, example that I can come up with would be the roadhouse in Talkeetna, the old historic roadhouse. Uh, for a group of 40 or 50 to go in there and have breakfast, lunch, or dinner wouldn't be an option. So, we made that conscious effort to focus on smaller groups. And with uh, the era of COVID, we've actually reduced those numbers more. So we're gonna travel with no more than uh, 24 passengers on any tour uh, in 2021, as we continue to move uh, through this uh, very challenging time for, for the country and certainly for, for an industry that's, uh, that's, that's been shook up a bit. But uh, we're excited about 2021 and the offerings that we have. Uh, We've been very blessed from the industry of journalism and the writers uh, over the last handful of years, especially, uh, and a lot of kudos to our team uh, that makes this happen. And I would say probably uh, most importantly to my wife, because uh, Lauren's the one who uh, takes care of all this marketing collateral and uh, our website and a lot of that stuff that comes out. So we've had a lot of great distinctions for her work, but again, primarily it goes back to the foundation. Uh, wildlife glaciers and scenery how can we create more of those opportunities and how can we give people the best snapshot of alaska in a 7 10 12 15 day land package uh, through the interior uh, a question that quite often comes up especially uh when we when we get into places like a dell web community in in sun city arizona or the villages in florida you know what, what's the average age of your traveler uh, am i too old am i too young um, no Absolutely not. Uh, we have we've had ages across the, the spectrum. Uh, like I said, uh, my dad took me to Alaska at age seven the first time and my siblings uh, at age six and ten. I took my son to Alaska in 2019 and he was seven years old. I think children, uh, young adults should witness and experience travel and Alaska is a great place for them to experience uh, some of the resources that we still have left that they, they have the opportunity to enjoy. But uh, with, a, with an organization that's, that's really kind of set itself apart by going to these unique destinations, flying out to remote villages across the, uh, the state, uh, and with the timeline of our, of our itineraries, uh, the average tends to be right around you know, 55 to 65 in terms of our, the average age of our travelers. A little bit more of a light adventure program, but as you can see, uh, we, we certainly accommodate everybody across the board. We have special programs for, for all the above. A question that um, I didn't really put in the quote here, but the, the question is what's, what's included with your tour? And I thought about that and I said, well, it's be pretty long winded for me to say what's included with our tours uh, from the taxes and port charges and fees to the uh, gratuities that go along with that, uh, the meals and the gratuities for the service, the attractions and activities on a day-to-day -day basis. Uh, that's 
you know, just a, a smidgen of what we lump into our programs, I think it's a lot easier to, to say what's, what's not included in our tour. Um, and that starts with airline tickets. Uh, another question that we have is airfare included uh, with our journeys to Alaska. Uh, we don't know if you are gonna be coming from Detroit, Michigan or Minneapolis, Minnesota or Phoenix, Arizona. So we do leave the air segment out, but our staff is absolutely happy to help you uh, uh, make those reservations um, and, and certainly uh, get you in at an appropriate time and make sure you're not departing too early where you feel rushed along the way. In fact, a lot of our clients will actually come in a day or two early just to get acclimated to the two or three or four hour time change that they're experiencing uh, before they settle into the start of their tour. Uh, the only people that you have to consider, uh, and this is certainly at your discretion, uh, passing a gratuity onto while you're in Alaska are your John Hall tour managers. Uh, you'll have your own private uh, individual designated tour manager, uh, person who's lived and breathed Alaska for a, a number of years. Uh, they're gonna be with you on the land tour. They're gonna share their experiences, their childhood, uh, the love of the culture and their favorite highlights of the state. Uh, and then when guests travel on the cruise ships with us, we also have a designated individual who takes that uh, seven or eight day uh, pass, inside passage cruise with you so that you still have a representative along the way. Uh, you tip these people, like I say, at your discretion, Certainly, uh, more emphasis is put on the land tour. Uh, they're your driver, they're your guide, uh, they're handling luggage. Uh, they're doing more of the heavy lifting, if you will, along the way, but extremely uh, knowledgeable, friendly, and I would say some of the greatest assets to our organization. And then the last item that's not included when you're thinking about what's the total cost of this package gonna be to me when it's all said and done is the trip insurance. Uh, we don't sell the trip insurance directly. We do recommend you look into it. Uh, Travelers Insured is a company we've worked with for a number of years. Uh, we can call them or you can call them and get information about their policies directly. Uh, but we certainly do absolutely recommend uh, uh, not just again to the era of COVID that we're living in, but uh, you never know when that emergency might happen uh, where you're being called back to home. Or uh, one of the memories that sticks with me is uh, when Katrina hit the Gulf Coast, uh, we had people that were stuck uh, getting off their cruise ship in Vancouver and couldn't fly home to Houston. And they were stuck there for the better part of a week before the flights uh, were able to get back into Houston. And Trip Insurance stepped in, covered their cost of the additional overnights, uh, meals uh, that, they, that they endured while they were there, and of course the changes to get them home. So uh, it's always based on a couple of variables, your age and the price of your tour, but certainly something you wanna look at and get it in place at the time that you make your final payment. Once you're committed to travel on that tour, then you make sure you get your trip insurance in place to, to give you really a truly worry-free experience start to finish. Uh, what if I don't like to fly? Well, I can look at this question two ways. Uh, we've had people over the years, we've been operating these trips that certainly have no desire to fly, won't get on a commercial airline and fly to Alaska, but they wanna see Alaska. Um, and they wanna see the interior of Alaska. They wanna see Denali. So, the way that we've accommodated these guests in the past is either A, they drive their vehicles to Alaska, uh, which we've had a number of people do, and they park their vehicles at our office in Anchorage uh, or at our, at our maintenance facility there. And then they take up a tour and then they drive back on the Alaska Highway to the lower 48 later in the summer or in the fall. Some people have opted to take a cruise north, leaving Seattle or well, Vancouver, sorry, uh, sailing the inside passage for seven days and then joining us in Seward or Anchorage uh, and doing a land tour and then sailing back to Vancouver uh, after the land tour. So they get two seven day cruises plus the land package, uh, probably somewhere in that 20 to 28 day time frame in total. Um, but again, if you live in Texas or Arizona, uh, especially in July and August, that's not a bad thing to do is to get away for a couple months like that. Uh, if you don't like flying, um, and I showed you the map earlier that had all the different routes on it with people flying. Um, not every one of our tours has flights included with it, uh, flights to remote places. Uh, we realize that not everybody's comfortable with getting in a little Cessna 208 or uh, De Havilland Beaver, De Havilland Otter and going to fly around uh, a mountain like Denali that you see here. But it is one of those things that I would say, if you have the opportunity to do it, uh, you should, you should absolutely do it. And our team isn't set up to push optional excursions upon guests as they travel through the interior because there's so much included with our package. Uh, but when you go to Talkeetna and Denali, if the weather's right and the mood is right, 
I would highly recommend that you get up in the air and see Alaska from eight or nine or 10,000 feet and get a better appreciation for how big that mountain is right there. Um, and they have some flights uh, with uh, partners of ours, K2 Aviation out of Talkeetna, where you'll actually fly around the mountain and then land on the glacier below. Uh, I did that trip with my son two years ago and my wife was not real excited that I did that because I told her I wouldn't put him in a small plane, but these are some of the best pilots in the world that spend their summers in Alaska and I trust them absolutely. Um, one of the final questions that we get, uh, you know, as people are preparing for Alaska is, well, can I do laundry? I'm going to be gone for 14 or 20 or 23 days. Uh, there are absolutely opportunities along the way. Uh, most every one of our hotel partners, other than partners in, uh, in Kantishna, the remote lodge in Denali, uh, where you have the operated, op opportunity to use the coin operated uh, washer and dryer in the hotels. Uh, my feelings on that, I can go either way. Um, I don't want you to go on vacation and spend time in line waiting for a washer or dryer to become available. Uh, so if you're taking a cruise, my recommendation is pay them the extra $25 and let them wash all your undies and socks and fold them up and send them back to you in a, in a basket with a big bow around it. Uh, but you know, you're talking about $5 a load in a hotel like this versus maybe $25 for a, for a small uh, laundry basket on the cruise ship. Uh, but there are opportunities to do laundry for certain. Uh, or if you're like me, I've done this to my poor wife. I got to Fairbanks. I sent my dirty clothes home in a UPS envelope and I bought new ones at Walmart. And then of course, uh, last question for the, for the evening is, um, are single travelers welcome? Absolutely single travelers are welcome. Uh, this lady right here, Betts, that's Miss Betty Carlson. Uh, as you can see, she's got two, four, six, eight stars on her jacket. And I think she even had more than that when it was all said and done. Um, Betty made 11 different trips to Alaska, uh, a few with Holland America. And then she met our organization in the early nineties. And she traveled with us, I think 10 times to Alaska or 11 times to Alaska. She was our, our 10 star general. Uh, she traveled alone. Sometimes she took her daughter or granddaughter with her, uh, but she, she preferred to uh, you know, make friendships along the way through our other travelers that joined those tours. Uh, she didn't didn't want to have a roommate. She just sometimes wanted to go by herself, and that was that was pretty awesome. And I I just say that uh, that says a lot about Alaska when a person is willing to make that much of an investment right there, 10, 11, 12 separate trips into the state. But uh, she certainly had a love affair like like we do with the state. Uh, on that along those same lines, uh, we do get requests or people ask about will we pair you up with another traveler, uh, a roommate along the way. Uh, not something we recommend. We would certainly never do a guaranteed share program. Or that's, that's an option that some of the cruise companies offer. With our land tours, you know, first off, uh, you're making a big investment to come into Alaska, the time frame, the monetary investment that goes with it. You don't want to be partnered up with somebody that may, you may not see eye to eye with. They may snore. You may not, you know, uh, they may like to stay up late and read books and you may not. You may be a, a person that goes to bed a little early. I think when we've accomplished this successfully in the past, what we've done is we've found people uh, from similar areas of the country, put them together, encourage them to have a cup of coffee or a phone conversation, kind of feel things up. Let's sign you up originally as a single traveler. And if this uh, new formed relationship or friendship with uh, this other individual works, then we'll put you into that double occupancy category and you'll each save a little bit of money. But uh, that's something you certainly, you definitely want to feel out. Um, I, I think that that's, uh, that's important, especially if you were thinking about taking a, a seven day cruise and, and being in a 170 square foot cabin for seven days together. Mm -hmm.